thank you so much for this opportunity. Right, okay, so we're here to imagine really what our priorities should be in the post-COVID city or even the co-COVID city, given how long um, this politically exacerbated infection period is likely to continue. Um, what I'd like to present are five critical contingencies, or I seem to see to be codependent criteria that really connect what a post-COVID city could look like to potentially what you know, a post-police city could look like or a post-racist or post-poverty or even post-zoonotic city could look like because these things are all profoundly interconnected. So we often hear the term post-Anthropocene post and it's a really intriguing term because it doesn't necessarily mean anything yet or at least um, it's fluid enough for us to contest it and tear it apart. But there's something always when we latch the term post onto anything that it kind of yokes us to some sense of a prior condition it's packed full of the standard human conceits that we are somehow divorced of our errors, um, our previous errors and crimes. But it, in fact, I think we're still very much unable to, if you like, move into this phase. Um, but I also like to see it as a mandate. Uh, how do we really start thinking about ending the anthropocentric, so the human-centered exploitation of the planet? Um, and I think when we look at it like that, we start to understand that we're now moving into a period where we understand um, intersectionality to mean that contingencies um, against uh, the discrimination against animals is obviously becomes a template for discrimination between humans and not just across species. And so the question becomes in a post COVID city, how can we move away from our unrelenting privileging of cities that are principally fit for humans rather than anything else and start to imagine what a multi species inhabitation could look like. And that's it's super interesting when you think about the possibilities typologically for designers. Oops, sorry, trying to find the next button. That we... um, and decolonization is another contingency. It's obviously come out of um, the roads must fall social movement in South Africa in 2015. Um, and this call to decolonize education, which was the driver for this dialogue, if you like, um, and education being the engine room of the construction of futures and professions. Um, this really puts pressure on the architectural humanities to reconstitute its canon, to think more carefully about its content, its methodologies and its masters, and also consider whose are the voices in the room, who are the voice of authority. But it creates space for the conversation to expand um, and to give authority to more peripheral protagonists. And I think this is really where this conversation might go later, hopefully in the Q&A, um, to start thinking about where is queer urbanism and deep, deep ecological thought situated in relation to this question. Um, I think more generally, the architecture and design disciplines are constrained by a lack of representation, a lack of listening and a lack of diversification. All of these bleed through into, I would say, the unequal city that we're here to discuss today and confront. Okay, um, Global South, again, I'm latching onto some what I call serial packet phrases right now that ignite um, huge resistance and, and, and I would say anxiety in many people, but we start looking at what Global South really means. Um, in relation to this topic. And I think it's, uh, you know, an understanding that we have failed um, collectively to really ensure that we have um, equitable um, exchange of knowledge, of materials, of labor across regions. And this is really about understanding that the Northern Hemisphere and the cities in it, and this is particularly North America and European cities of, of if you like, allowed imperialism to embed a system of, I would say, hungry city excess where our, our demands for energy, our demands for materials, talent migration, affluence and so on, um, have perpetuate inequalities that will in many ways disable our abilities to form any kind of meaningful, lasting and universal resistance to the virus. Um, and so this really starts to point towards the idea of a kind of post-humanities. Um, and I think it's an understanding that, um, you know, we need to move beyond these blinker perspectives about what we think a discipline's obligations are um, and start to understand that, you know, if you like, the climate change imperative as being entirely around um, and the climate crisis imperative as being um, what will drive um, principally um, many of the changes for oh, someone's talking and it's a bit distracting. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, so supply chain slavery. So materiality is key. What are we going to make the new city from? We already know, for example, that the PPE right now is filling the oceans. It's killing fish. It's another environmental crisis on top of the many others we as a species have enacted. Um, so this idea about actually thinking um, who is supplying the materials needed to form some kind of meaningful resistance against the virus and also who has access to them. We're not even medics in the US and the UK, for example, have proper PPE. Um, you know, we need to start looking at what, if you like, a democratized materiality could look like and, and who is able to access it, but also who is exploited in, in the production um, in its supply. So I think this obviously lends itself to 
a more broad question about what social justice is. Again, this idea of us coming up with these terminologies, provocations is, you know, these are extremely broad, obviously. But, you know, understanding social inequality to be inscribed in the built environment of cities, that's what bit cities have been built for. They are in themselves um, icons of inequality. That's what they serve to do. They were invented to create partitions between, if you like, the rural and, and the urban and to create hierarchies within regions and countries and societies and, and, and across, um, if you like, continents um, that would privilege certain groups over others. The idea of being able to um, have any kind of conversation about what a COVID, post-COVID city could look like without really confronting um, social justice is just simply impossible because there is no spatial justice without social justice. And we should remember also that the COVID virus is actually just a proxy for us in a way. It's it's kind of embedding all our rights right now. It's it's discriminating um, in the way that it will punish um, more um, poorer communities than it does affluent communities. Um, it's it, We're at the mercies of political leadership or a, or a lack thereof in terms of our risk factors. Um, if you like, um, again, there's a regional bias. It's really, really obvious about how it's um, discriminating right now. But it's really just carrying out an, as an agent on our behalf, a kind of, I would say, an illustration of the way that we have not, we are not only continuing to um, harm each other, but harm um, other species across the planet. And in a way, um, as it acts out its consequences of inequality and justice and exploitation now upon us, what we now need to recognize is that it's, it's agency it, um, and actually seeing it as an agent of change for us becomes, um, I would say, a, a political and a philosophical, but also a design obligation.